Thank you very much. It's wonderful to be back in, in Brussels. I, I have been given the challenge of uh, discussing with you the next 50 years of physics in a dark room without windows an hour after lunch. So I already see some of you recoiling in horror at the prospect of equations and, 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 and tensor calculus. I'm not going to do that. I've called my presentation a theory of everything else. Um, physicists today, professional physicists, are developing various theories of everything to try to reconcile the two major successful theories of physics today, general relativity and quantum mechanics. There are a couple of dirty little secrets in there that they are not telling you. The first one is that these two theories, which each of which works very well in its own domain, are in violent contradiction in most of our world every day, especially with gravity. The, uh, therefore, the, the, the idea is to try to develop theories of everything that would reconcile somehow, like string theory and others, would reconcile the, these two dominant views of, uh, of physics. The other uh, dirty little secret is that in all that, we have left out a missing child. The missing child is the little sister of physics, is the physics of information, and that's what I would like to talk about this afternoon. The physics they teach us in college and in universities is the physics of energy. It has to do with lasers and colors and particles and mass and fields, whatever a field is, and acceleration and inertia and all these things that you've been exposed to in high school or college and university. The, uh, the problem is that they also teach us that information and energy are two sides of the same coin, but they never bothered to teach us the physics of information. They continue to teach us the physics of energy. Now, going back to the 19th century, James Maxwell, discussing thermodynamics, took a ve very simple idea that if you pour hot liquid into a cold liquid, the, there will be an average temperature of, li of the liquid between these two, uh, these two components. The only way to stop that would be for a little demon, Maxwell's demon, to be there and to separate these molecules. But absent this demon, the law of thermodynamics will say the two liquids will mix and will reach an average tepid temperature. Uh, Leo Zillard, who was a colleague of Einstein uh, in 1929, went st one step further and said for the demon to be able to do this, the demon needs information about which molecules are hot and which molecules are cold. If the demon knows that, then the demon can, in fact, keep the two liquids separated and will, they will never reach an average temperature. But that means that there is just as much information as there is energy in the system and that information and energy are, in fact, the two sides of the same coin. So where is the missing sister of physics? The physics of energy has to do, again, with particles and atoms and fundamental forces and mass and entropy and fields and space dimensions, x, y, and z, uh, and t for time, and momentum and inertia and speed and so on. But we never talk about similar concepts on the side of the physics of information. And my argument is that in the next 50 years, we will. I should disclose to you I'm in a field where everybody works on full disclosure, so I might as well confess to you that I dropped out of physics. I, I passed, I have a, an advanced degree in physics only because I was, I was good in math, so I could work out the equations and get the answer. Uh, but then I dropped out of it for, for a couple of reasons. First, I could never understand what they meant when they said time was a dimension. They say, okay, there is x, y, and z, so I get that from common experience, and they say, think of time the same way, only in the equation you put a little i in front of t, 
for square root of minus one, but don't, don't, don't think about that. And then you treat it the same way and everything works fine. And that's in, in general relativity and other, uh, other areas of physics, that's what you do. I, I could never get that because in X, I can, you know, I can go this way or I can go that way. In time, I cannot, I'm not allowed to do that. So we're very good at talking about how time passes. We don't know why time passes. Similarly, we're very good at talking about how things fall down. We don't know why they fall down. And again, this is not something that you've been taught in physics in college. They never said that they couldn't explain those two things. The third thing that disgusted me was uh, particles. Uh, you, you know, we have particles inside the atom and then we have particles inside the particles. We have particles inside electrons and photons and everything else. And then, uh, since it still doesn't quite doesn't work very well, we have particles of subparticles, and that reminds me of something that happened to astronomy in the Middle Ages when they had cycles and epicycles and epicycles of epicycles. If you keep doing that, everything works fine, except that that's not the way reality works. So I thought they should go on doing this. They should go on with the physics of energy. We achieve wonderful things with that science, but that's not what I really want to do. So I went back to the missing sister, looking for the missing little sister of physics. And it turns out it's asking fundamental questions about the nature of time and also about some of the things that happen in our lives, like coincidences. On July 20, 1996, um, we had a house in the country north of San Francisco, a wonderful area full of redwoods, and we had some friends over for an evening for dinner, and one of uh, our friends was a woman who said I, she was going to be in a play in uh, Mendocino County, and she, in the play she was going to read something in French, and she had not practiced French for a while. So she asked us if we had a book in, in French, and we had a, a bookshelf with English and French books. My wife pulled out a novel, which was this novel by René Barjavel, La Peau de César, and she gave it to me, and I opened it at a random page. And I read a passage at random, which was, I was in the Boeing that blew up after takeoff at Kennedy Airport, a bomb in the hold, 132 dead, remember? Well, this was three days after uh, Boeing took off from Kennedy Airport and blew up over the Atlantic. And we were shocked by this. And if you think, if you talk about this kind of coincidence with your friends, you'll find that many people have in fact had that kind of experience. This was not precognition. This was three days after the uh, TWA 800 accident 